<clears throat> Thank you for joining the ACA Small Business Boot Camp and Resource Collective for this Thursday, January 7th. Uh, we're glad to have you with us. I'm Robert Theobald, the Small Business Ombudsman and Vice President of Small Business Services here at the Arizona Commerce Authority. Um, as we get started, I want to first start by thanking all of our community partners. Uh, our community partners allow us and support us to do these boot camps. They provide content and their expertise and our time, and we very much appreciate all that they do to help to support this program. The Small Business Boot Camp and Resource Collective is designed to help small businesses work through the COVID crisis and, and return stronger than ever. We started the program back in April of 2020. Um, as we all thought that the COVID was only going to be a six to eight week uh, blip in our in our year. And as we realized that it was going to be longer and the program was being successful, we wanted to continue it. And uh, we are continuing it into 2021. Uh, we've got a lot of great content planned. It is a statewide initiative supported by our community partners. And uh, they're bringing some great presentations to us uh, this year. Uh, additionally, the Boot Camp and Resource Collective, we have a great website set up. Uh, with the information. Uh, this website includes the link to register for upcoming session, but we also have all of our 110 plus previous sessions recorded and stored on this page so you can access them uh, by week from last year. Uh, so if you're looking for a specific marketing or business leadership or um, one of the other sessions that we've done, uh, business planning, Etc. Those sessions are recorded um, and, and on this website. Again, there's over 110 sessions available to go back and review. Additionally, on the website, we have our resource collective and our resource collective includes tools and, and guides provided by our community partners to help small businesses. Uh, they're downloadable, reviewable. Uh, there's a lot of great information on this page um, and I encourage everybody to take a look at it. This is just a sample of some of the guides and resources that are available on the resource collective. Uh, we've got uh, guidance for retail, safe retail, barbershops and cosmetologists, restaurant industry guidance, manufacturing, construction, HR, unemployment. There's a lot of great uh, resources available on the resource collective. Some quick updates. Uh, we've heard a lot about PPP, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, coming back with the new stimulus bill, also included in that was a few other programs. The Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program has been extended. Uh, we haven't received the guidance on when it's going to reopen on the application, but they are reopening the um, advance slash grant and the loan program as part of that. Um, additionally, in the stimulus package was a shuttered venue operator grant program and we have a little bit of information from the bill uh, on our website. We are still waiting for more details from the SBA on how that program will work, but it's uh, it's exciting to see a program directed to these, these businesses directly. Additionally, uh, statewide, we have the safest outside of restaurant assistant program. And on Tuesday, uh, the governor expanded the program with an additional $2 million and extended the application date in the March. Uh, so we're excited about that. If you have a restaurant or know somebody owns or owns a restaurant, there's opportunities to expand their premises um, and get the grant to help support that. Additionally, I want to uh, share again with you about the Globe Small Business Relief Fund. If you are in Globe or know somebody with a business in Globe, there's a small window to apply for a grant program that they are offering to businesses in their in their town. Um, you can find the information on local first AZ. They're hosting the grant for, for the city of Globe. Additionally, uh, for additional uh, COVID-19 business resources and financial resources and guidelines, you can visit our COVID-19 business resource page uh, on our website. It is a great tool and, and resource to have favorite it and in your uh, easy access uh, toolbar so you can access the current information. We update it constantly as new information comes out. Additionally, for all those that are new, I wanna share some of the programs that we have for small businesses here at the Arizona Commerce Authority. We have our small business services and these programs can help with navigating the through the SBA, with the small business development centers, 
with SCORE, local banking contacts, et cetera. Our workforce division can help support businesses that are looking to hire employees um, or upskill their employees. They have some federal programs that help support both of those. And then our Arizona MEP, Manufacturing Extension Partnership, uh, can help support manufacturers um, as they work through the COVID crisis and uh, look to expand and grow their operations. For those that are looking to start a side gig or start a new business, we have our small business checklist as well. And this is an online interactive tool that helps individuals and those looking to start a business or expand their business to understand the local state and federal information on licensing, registration, and compliance. Uh, there's a lot of great information on there for your business uh, as you're getting to start or expand it. So uh, you can take a look at that at azcommerce.com forward slash small biz. We also like to do a quick uh, reminder of the state's COVID-19 information and resource website, arizonatogether.org. Uh, lots of great uh, information there. So we have some upcoming sessions next week. Uh, Yesterday, we had a great PPP session uh, with lots of information. And late last night, the SBA sent out a little bit of, sent out some new information, a couple hundred pages worth, it looks like. I've got a bunch of reading to do today. Um, but we're gonna do another PPP session on Wednesday. So on Tuesday, we've got some social media marketing in 2021, a look at how 2021, uh, what type of social media marketing uh, was being projected to, uh, be some of those key things uh, for your businesses. That's um, Giselle Aguiar is a, an expert on it and we're looking forward to her presentation. That'll be at 9 a.m. on Tuesday. And then on Thursday, uh, we've got a digital marketing expert that's gonna share tools and tips and tricks for LinkedIn. Um, so if you, for those of you that are on LinkedIn and have been using it, uh, it's gonna be a great session as well. If you're not on LinkedIn, it'd be a great opportunity to learn more about it. Um, again, that'll be at 9 a.m. A note on here that I want to uh, make everybody aware of, our normal sessions on Tuesdays and Thursdays are at 9 a.m. This coming Wednesday's special PPP session is at 11 a.m. Uh, so please make note of that. It's a little bit later, um, but we want to make sure we um, let everybody know about that time difference. So we look forward to having you on our, you know, on our session today. And we also look forward to those of you that can attend next week's sessions. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the time over to Tom Argero. Tom is the executive director of the North Phoenix Chamber of Commerce and a small business owner. And we are looking forward to his presentation today. Um, so Tom, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and turn the time over to you. Perfect, thank you, Robert, appreciate the introduction. And let me get my screen share set up here. Yeah, going through that introduction just now, Robert, I was just blown away with the resources that you've curated uh, at the Arizona Commerce Authority. <laughs> There's just so much there. I'm gonna be providing backlinks to you from the Chamber website. I didn't realize there was quite so much out here. Um, <laughs> you've got a pretty, pretty deep uh, collection of, of content that will just continue to grow and, and evolve, which is important. Yeah, we couldn't do it without, you know, community partners like yourself, Tom. So we appreciate your help yep. and support. And, and I appreciate the chamber being, a, you guys including us as one of your community partners. Uh, so as Robert had mentioned, I'm the executive director here at the North Phoenix Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I have an opportunity to talk to an awful lot of business owners, a lot of startups, um, and some more mature businesses as well. And this business model canvas is something I have been using extensively for, I don't know, five years now at least. Even if I don't have a canvas in front of me, if I don't have the check boxes in front of me, I'm asking questions typically of somebody about their business and about, you know, what they're planning and their financial health and you know how well they're organized and marketing plans and all that sort of stuff and i'm thinking about it all from what you're going to see today from the perspective of this business model canvas this is basically a business plan on a page uh 
got to click on that in order to go there. It's basically a business plan on a page. It's a very high level summary snapshot of, think of it as a, as a 50,000 foot view of your business for a, for a uh, business plan. However, this does not replace a business plan. You cannot go to a venture capitalist or walk into a bank uh, or probably even you would have trouble applying for an SBA loan if this is all you had in terms of a, of a business plan. Uh, this is a great way to flush out ideas that you might be mulling over if you think you've got an idea for a new business or if you're considering adding a new product line to an existing business or you're just, you know, you're feeling creative and you want to, you know, just dump a thought or you and a friend are sitting over drinks and, and you grab a bar napkin and you start to sketch out the world's best next money-making gig. Following this structure, and I'm going to walk you through how to use this canvas today. Uh, walking through this process will help you identify <laughs> whether or not you've, you really have a good idea. And then it'll give you some opportunity to go test the assumptions that you're making about this idea that you're you're dumping onto this canvas. So I'm going to jump on in. Uh, this is going to look a little confusing. We're going to start on the right side and work our way to the left is the way this thing is organized. And it took me a while to wrap my head around that being backwards um, as well. For as long as I've been using this, I still think it's backwards, but there's actually some, some rhyme and reason to this. The first five boxes that we'll dive into and don't let all the arrows confuse you or, or overwhelm you. The first five boxes are really the customer facing half of the equation of your business. We're gonna start out talking about the customer segment over on the left, on the far right side, excuse me. And then we're gonna leap across to your value proposition and then work our way back into the center between those two of how you interact, how your value prop interacts with your customers. That's what boxes three and four will represent. And all of that of course is intended to generate a revenue stream at the bottom of that right half. Your whole back office operation, everything going on behind the stage uh, is over on the left side. You have resources that you need to bring to bear in order to provide your value to your customers. You have activities within those resources that you're performing with those resources. Um, all of that has comes with an expense. That's the cost structure on the bottom left. And you can't operate a business in a vacuum. So you have key partners that are plugged into the external to your business and, and reaching in and helping suppliers, et cetera. So I'm gonna dive into each of the nine boxes one at a time and walk you through very high level how to, uh, how to think about these and how to dive into the, the content. The customer segment, you're typically trying to identify who is your best customer. And if you can do that in terms of uh, demographics, geographic, psychographic, you're further ahead than a lot of other business owners already. If you understand how to address your ideal client or who your ideal customer is, excuse me. This particular worksheet that I've discovered through the growth wheel, uh, and that's available through the SBDC. If you, if you uh, work with them, it's part of SBA and they have access to the growth wheel and you can get access to, to 100 of these worksheets. But their client persona in particular, uh, I think does a great job of helping identify the pain points and the psychographics that your ideal customer has and how they, how they fit. So if you, if you think about their brain first, what's in their head, what are they thinking? What ideas and assumptions and, and opinions does your ideal client have about the product or service that you're selling? How do they feel about it with their heart? And what are their concerns? What are their interests? What are their preferences? Uh, we'll dive a little bit further into that as we get through the canvas a little bit further. What are they doing with their hands? You know, what are they responsible for? What projects are they working on? What activities are they performing as part of their job, as part of your ideal client, all right? And then where are their feet taking them? <laughs> where are they going? What direction is their business heading? What changes or opportunities are in front of them? All right. So if you, if you think about your ideal client and you 
can get a handle on at least a few of these boxes, if not all of them, if you can get a handle on just half of those, those dozen boxes, you're going to be much further ahead. You're going to start to understand their pain points and how to communicate to them and what they're looking for in the product or service you provide. The bottom section of this, this uh, worksheet also contains some other uh, ways to think about the current situation that your current ideal client is in. What challenges do they face? What needs do they have, et cetera? So that's, that's a very fun hour or two to spend stump sitting out in the middle of nowhere, clear your head, um, have no other distractions, no cell phone with you, and just a copy of this worksheet and, and do a little brainstorming. Very fun exercise. And once you've gotten through that process, the next step of the business model canvas is to uh, dive into how your product or service in particular addresses what that ideal client, what your ideal customer is thinking and feeling and doing and where they're heading. There's gonna be pain points and gain points throughout all of their psychographic and um, their attitudes and their, and their thoughts and feelings. And if you're addressing those pain points with pain relievers, or you're addressing their opportunities and their aspirations with gain makers of some sort, that's the value proposition that your business offers. Right. But if you can't spell out how you help them with what they're concerned about and how your product addresses their concerns, uh, you may have some trouble with the next piece, which is the marketing component to all this. The third box that we're going to talk about here are the channels that you use to interact with between your value and the client. So if I go back a couple of slides, we'll jump back to slide three here in a second. This is that bridge between that third box, the channels is that bridge between how you're interacting with your customers. And those channels include uh, your social media platforms and, and how you talk to or interact with your clients. It could be your, uh, your website, it's your email uh, campaigns, face-to-face -face sales presentations that you're providing, face-to-face -face relationship building, not always a sales presentation. You know, it's networking events and all sorts of other, other places. The important questions here under the channel is where are they hanging out? Is it online? Are they hanging? Or do you have access to them through, you know, their church, through a social organization, through, you know, some other means of, of reaching uh, your ideal client? Where are they hanging out with their family, with their friends? Where are they shopping? And how can you reach them there? Give that some thought. And then how is each of those channels where you're interacting with your client, potential client, integrated with the, the cycles that your potential customer is going through as they're becoming aware of your product, they're evaluating options, they're making a purchase decision, they're taking delivery, and there's an ongoing relationship. That's all related to the channel that you're using, or multiple channels that you're using, like your social media platforms and accounts and et cetera. The relationship that you build with your customer is not just through the channels, but it's for a specific reason. Your customer is eventually gonna purchase from you. So does your ideal client already consume the type of a product or service that you're proposing, something new and different, and how are they expecting to interact with you at the purchase time? Do they want to self-serve? You know, they, they're accustomed to being online and filling out a form and making a credit card payment and receiving whatever. Uh, think of Netflix as <laughs> a great example. Um, you sign up for a Netflix account, you stick in a credit card number, and you just start streaming your video. You didn't have to call a sales rep. You didn't have to talk to somebody on the phone to set up your account. All right, you don't have to make a cash payment in order to have access to Netflix. 
So is your, let's say your business that you've come up with is some way to stream videos and you wanna do that on a subscription basis, but it requires you to talk to somebody in order to make the sale and it requires a cash purchase because you don't want the credit card payments uh, expense, for instance. You might be making some assumptions that are gonna be difficult to fulfill because your ideal client is already established a relationship behavior and a pattern with uh, consuming the product that you're trying to, to disrupt, right? Uh, so are they accustomed to self-serve? Are they accustomed to automation? Are they accustomed to personal assistance? Are they accustomed to having a dedicated support person like an insurance agent that helps clear the noise and the confusion about what insurance is or financial advice or whatever the product is and so on? So that's what the relationship box is for. And as I'd said earlier, uh, everything on the right half of this canvas is all designed and intended to generate revenue for your business eventually. It all becomes part of the sales cycle. It's the, the top of funnel marketing, nurturing people through the sales funnel and eventually collecting some revenue in your business. So the questions you need to ask and the assumptions that you need to test as you're building out your idea or fine tuning an existing idea, are your customers willing to pay for what it is that you're providing? What value are they willing to pay for, right? What are, their, what are they currently paying for? <laughs> and, and how are they paying for it? And that's where I'd asked earlier about you know, credit versus cash. If you're coming up with a credit model and they're only a cash client or the other way around, you may have your hands full trying to convert them to change their approach, right? Their normal way of interacting. Uh, you will obviously have, or you could obviously have multiple revenue streams. So how does this particular product line that you're working through or a particular item uh, contribute percentage wise to your overall revenue stream? And then again, pricing models is something to take into account. Are these, are this a one-time purchase? Is it a you know, monthly subscription? Do you have discounts because of volume, you know, bundle and save? Or are you uh, setting up a bartering arrangement and willing to accept that, et cetera. So everything in these first five boxes, you can think of your value proposition as a, as a theater stage and the curtain is open up on the right side. Your audience and the ticket counter and the popcorn machine and everything that they're interacting with is on the right half of that stage of that theater production that you're putting on. That's your value proposition. Everything behind the stage, behind the curtain and backstage is the next set of four boxes we're gonna talk about. And it's all of your internal operations within your business. You cannot deliver your value to your client without having some resources to bring to bear, right? Those resources are the raw materials that you're providing. It's the human, time that you're investing and the staff that you have in your within your business it's physical inventory it's a storefront uh, those are all your resources it's it's all of your social media accounts and your facebook account your linkedin account uh, your youtube channel all the places where all those resources that you're using for the channels plus more it's your it everything fits within this resource key resources that are required <clears throat> excuse me, key resources that are required in order to deliver your product or service to your client. And the next box just above that then are the activities. You document those as well here. So this is the time that you're spending with your social media posts. This is time that you're spending, you know, your scripts for your phone calls and your sales presentations and your FAQs and managing objections. All those things that are part of your sales cycle are activities, for instance, that you're using within your, uh, within your business. So you're identifying back here on uh, the sixth box, your resources, and then above it, you're documenting the activities you're performing with those resources, right? And then all of that, of course, comes with a cost. So understanding the costs that are involved in what it is that you're hoping to deliver as a new product or service. 
that cost structure, right, is all the all the things that are part of your resources. Those are where you're incurring your costs. The goal is to be generating more revenue than you are expenses and more costs. But think about the costs that you're incurring as well. Um, you know, what are the most important core costs? Are there things that you can spin off or delegate out or offset or wait to, to uh, incur until you get further down into the life cycle of your, your project? Um, which ones are the most expensive? Which activities require the most financial support and expense? And then determining if you're fully funded and have enough resources to, to get up and running. And again, you can't do all this in a vacuum. You're going to require folks to provide raw materials to you if you're manufacturing. You're going to require, you've got a landlord if you have a storefront. You have key partnerships. Um, as the executive director of a chamber of commerce, I hope that, you know, I'd like to stick the bug in your ear too, that the key partnerships include organizations and, and uh, trade associations and things like the chamber um, BNI chapters that you might belong to, et cetera. There are, you know, you can't run your business without having all those other partnerships. How much and where you delegate and how much you lean on them and how strong those partnerships are and how dependent you are on them become kind of important assumptions and, and decisions you need to make as well and test. You don't want to be completely dependent on one provider for a raw material and then they go out of business and your whole pipeline dies and your whole business dies. All right, so there's some things here to, to be aware of as you think through your partnerships. And you've heard me say on just about every one of those boxes that you're making assumptions about things that you need to go test. And most of us don't think about those assumptions. I love this little cartoon that I found in this book, uh, Talking to Humans. I have the 86 page PDF that I found available at a university and it's up on my Google Drive. Actually, I'm sharing it from the university's drive. I didn't snag a copy, I'm just pointing to it. Uh, Talking to Humans is a great book that is all about taking the assumptions that you make in that business model canvas, in that lean canvas, and going and testing them. This cartoon is just is perfect. I'm also a software developer and I own a business myself. And uh, I love this guy's quote. If I were the teenage uh, girl target that, you know, that our business is targeting, I would totally love this new product, this new app that we're creating. And the other guy says, have we even left the room? You know, have we even gone and talked to the, the little 10 year old girl that we're building an app for? None of us are 10 year old girls. How do we know that this is gonna work? <laughs> How are they gonna pay for it? How are, you know, they don't have credit cards and we're setting up this payment structure, you know, whatever. You're making some pretty big assumptions typically about what you're gonna provide and, and the business that your, uh, your product or your service. Uh, so the major assumptions that you really need to think about, the most critical ones, of course, is does your value proposition really address the needs of who you think your target audience is? And are they willing to pay for that? And if, you, if, if those two bullet points fail, can you build it? You know, if you can't do those three things, or you're asking the customer to consume this very differently than they're already accustomed to, if you can't fulfill at least those three or four bullets, you're gonna have a lot of trouble getting a product launched, right? So assumptions, we all make them. And, and you just, you need to be aware of the assumptions you're making and you need to have a way of somehow interviewing people, questioning them, sending out surveys, you know, one-on-one -on -one or focus groups is a great way to, to test these assumptions. And there's a whole, <laughs> talking to humans, there's an entire book about the subject of how to get away from your desk, get away from your business model canvas that you just created and go determine whether or not you're on the right path. Uh, this presentation, if you've been a part of uh, following what the Arizona Commerce Authority has been doing all since uh, what, March, April, um, I did that first half of this presentation 
back in June, it was June 29th, I think, from when I was digging up my slides and refreshing them for this presentation. And that's pretty much where we stopped uh, six months ago. Uh, the good folks at the Arizona Commerce Authority, Robert and, and Faith, reached out to me uh, a couple weeks ago during the, during the Christmas break and asked me to breathe some life back into this presentation and to include, since it's first of the year and we're all around goal setting, to include another component to this. So my next three or four slides, next few slides, will take you through what I think, actually this is what I'm doing, both for the chamber and for my own business right now. I'm going through this exercise and, and preparing my goals and executing my goals for this first quarter. And in fact, I'm thinking about this entire year now in quarterly chunks. It's, it's difficult to set a goal and say, you know, by next December, I'm gonna have, you know, 100,000 in income. But I can certainly break that down and say within the next quarter, I can generate 20 of that. And the quarter after that, I can generate another 25 for a couple quarters during the summer and 30 grand, you know, during the last quarter of the year. And if I think about breaking down into quarterly chunks into 12 week segments, now I've got something every week that I can work on a dozen times. And it's much more manageable to, to think in those chunks. Uh, there's a book out uh, called The 12 Week Year. It's probably a 10 year old book by, the, by now, a dozen years old. Um, but I encourage you to go take a look at the 12 week year. And he talks about exactly this. It's building a cycle and a cadence of, of working in a quarterly view. What I wanted to do for this today was to show you how to, how to set some SMART goals um, and, and have them around the components of the business model canvas in particular. So if you were to think about the next 12 weeks and spend, you know, we're already a week into the year. So between now and about well, tomorrow's Friday, <laughs> between now and tomorrow at five o'clock, if you could flush out an, an initial business model canvas for your business and figure out how you're gonna start testing your assumptions, you're gonna be off to a great start. This is perfect timing for this year. If you could spend one day each next week and just give a half hour to on Monday thinking about your customer segment and give half an hour on Tuesday thinking about your value proposition. And if you could fit in on Wednesday and think about your key resources and the activities that you're performing. And Thursday, think about your revenue streams. And by Friday, you're gonna dive into something that's gonna feel much more complicated. I dedicated a whole slide to the, to the fifth thing to do on week two, but it's really not that complex. But I had a lot to say here. Um, if you can spend one day next week thinking about the channels that you're gonna to use to interact with your clients, that's your marketing basically, and the relationships that you're gonna build, that's the sales. And I really didn't have a whole lot here in this, around the sales cycle. Um, you can, you're definitely gonna to need to do some more research and keep digging. But for your marketing plan, if you think about the next 12 weeks and you set some concrete goals about you, what you wanna accomplish in your business, I've laid out some that I think are fairly aggressive and yet doable. Uh, I've had to breathe some life back into our chamber's social media account, for instance. And I set a goal about three months ago to have one post per day as a minimum on social media, on our chamber's Facebook page, just so that the Facebook algorithms start to see us again, a handful of followers start to see us again. Uh, I've also done some research in the past week about how important it is on YouTube to hit your first 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 hours of folks viewing your videos, whether they're subscribers or not. Everything I'm reading says that requires about 35 videos. And a lot of you are going, oh, good Lord, I can't come up with 35 videos on my YouTube channel right now. Surprisingly, you can. One minute, two minute, five minute segments answering, answering uh, how to's right around your product. Um, it's, it's not as difficult as you think. And you can go do some research on the types of videos that will help you hit your first 1,000 subscribers. There's a ton of content out there. 
if you can get a blog post out per week uh, to help drive traffic to the videos and to your lead magnets, your lead magnets, including an opt-in pages, if you could generate one of those a week, by the end of this quarter, you're going to have a dozen. You're going to have a dozen blog posts, a dozen uh, lead magnets to fill up your pipeline that will help build your uh, viewership on, on social media, on uh, YouTube channel, on your newsletter. Uh, once a month, if you could put out a press release, you're going to have three press releases by the end of the quarter. And I've got something to say about press releases here in a second. If you can turn out a couple of webinars per month, you're going to have three to six webinars before the quarter is over. A lot of marketers will tell you press releases are dead. And they say that because the search engine algorithms have discovered that the content typically in press releases is a sales pitch and it's not really newsworthy. My argument against that thought is that at least here within our chamber of commerce, within the North Phoenix chamber, we have a page on our site where we publish our members press releases. So we're not pushing things out onto PR Newswire or the, the feeds that Google and other search engines are not giving much credit to anymore. But instead, Google is still crawling the chamber site and looking for content. And when they find your business mentioned, they find keyword rich content about your business without keyword stuffing, you gotta be careful there because the algorithms have gotten smarter. When they find quality backlinks from a trusted source like the Chamber of Commerce or other places where you can publish your press releases and those quality backlinks back to your website and your presence online, it all just helps add to your Google juice, to your momentum. Webinars make you a, an authority in your, in your subject as well and, uh, and can be repurposed. The press releases can be repurposed and that's really the key here uh, with a press release. Just getting it published and stuck on our website helps with your SEO. The next step is you take that link and you blast it out across your social media and you say, look what the XYZ organization said about my business. And now you've increased your street cred in a way, you've elevated your business in a way that uh, you can't pay for that kind of marketing, right? And for the, for the momentum you're gonna get from that. And it costs you nothing besides being a member of an organization that allows that press content, right? So all of this, all of your marketing uh, goals for the quarter as you're performing each of these activities that I've outlined here, those are all leading activities. And if you focus on that lead activity, you know, you're watching how many calories you eat every day and how much exercise you're, you're performing. The lagging indicator is how much you weigh Monday morning when you stand on the scale. It's the measurement at the end of the production of everything that you could have predicted for the past week based on if you take the weight loss analogy or, you know, uh, the fact that you're consuming less calories and, perform, and performing some activity is all the leading activities that can be used to predict what you're going to weigh Monday morning when you, when you get on the scale. But you can stare at the scale all day long, and that number is not going to change. And that's the, lead, the lagging indicator. So in, the business, in your business life, your lagging indicators are things like the number of customers you have and the revenue you generated this month. You can stare at those numbers, you can focus on it and say, yeah, I wanna make you know, 25 grand in sales in the next quarter. That's great, you can say that all day long, but that's the leading activities that get you to the point where that cash is finally generated. So uh, a couple things to track when you set up your goals for the quarter or for the entire year, however you set this up, Focus on documenting the leading activities that you're performing, like your social media posting and recording videos and promoting your newsletter, et cetera. And then monitor each week, how many customers did you pick up? How many, you know, how much did you earn? Monitor that lagging activity and start making adjustments accordingly. So from weeks three through 12, now you're just executing the plans that you've put into place on that previous 
planning calendar that I just showed you. And a way to make this digestible, because those seemed like lofty goals, right? I mean, it's coming up with 35 videos in a quarter and a dozen blog posts. I mean, there's a lot of work here. But if you time, if you time block and you do this in chunks and you just dedicate a, maybe an hour or two on Monday to make sure that you've got social media posts scheduled out for the next couple of weeks, you only need to spend a couple hours on Monday and you don't have to think much about it again. But you're taking that proactive step and, and setting up, there's all kinds of tools out there to do it, um, to help you with uh, like Hootsuite, et cetera, that will do scheduled posts for you. Find one of those, learn how to use it. Uh, on Tuesday, record a couple of videos. Maybe it's not until Saturday or Sunday that you get them edited. Maybe you offload those to somebody that can edit and, and get them up onto your YouTube channel. Uh, but dedicate some time one day a week to just record a couple of videos and carve out a couple hours to do it. Uh, on another day, think about creating a lead magnet, you know, a checklist, a calendar, um, a planning tool, um, a worksheet that someone can fill out. All of those things are lead magnets and you tie a landing page to it so that in order to get access to that document, somebody has to give you at least their first name and an email address. And at that point, they're added to your, to your drip campaign. That's what lead magnets are. Uh, write a blog post one day in, in a week and spend a couple hours doing that. On Friday, on one day a week, I, this is how I typically run the chamber. I've been doing this for about six years now. Um, I spend about half an hour. It's not any more complicated than that, where I'm basically curating content that I've been producing throughout the course of the week. So for the chamber, it's the calendar of events for the next 30 days. It's you know highlighting a, a press release that came in this week, et cetera, and just little sections within a newsletter pulled together quickly. So here, let's say on a Friday, you're putting together, you know, you're highlighting your most recent blog posts, maybe pointing to your social media site and promoting something, uh, one of your videos that you've edited, et cetera. And you pull this together into a newsletter and schedule the newsletter to go out at a time when you know that your audience is going to be there, right, and seeing it. We get flooded with a lot of stuff on Monday mornings, and that's for a reason. So maybe hold off till Tuesday at 7 a.m. to schedule your newsletter to go out. Uh, but have, have it in the queue and, and, and think about it and sit on it for the weekend. Get back in maybe and, and touch it one more time and fine-tune it before it actually shoots out on the schedule. Um, and that's, that's a very easy cadence to, to get in the habit of doing. If you do these steps for the next quarter, you're, even if you only hit 30% or 40% of your goals, uh, you're going to be so much further ahead than you were without taking this kind of activity. And you're going to be so much further ahead of your competitors. And you've got a second quarter then to close the gaps and get the rest of the 35 videos posted. Etc. So document your weekly activities, come up with a spreadsheet and make it easy to say, you know, day after day, uh, you know, did I, did I make my, are my social media posts done or did I record a video, etc. And spend time documenting, keep track of the activities and then track your uh, lagging indicators as well. So that's how I would approach. These are smart goals, obviously. It's, um, they're actionable, they're uh, timely, they're uh, strategic, they're um, realistic, they're time bound. Um, and if you think of each of these as a smart goal for your business and for the marketing component of your business, you're going to be way ahead, way ahead of your competitors. That is it for my presentation today. Where are we time wise? We got about 15 minutes left on the call. Um, there's ways to contact me. If you want a copy of a planning calendar, if you could shoot an email over to my HBG consulting email address and ask for a copy of that, and I'll, I'll shoot that back over to you. So I've got a much more uh, in-depth version of this schedule um, and how to think about the social media posts and all that sort of stuff. So uh, if you're interested in a more, more in-depth calendar, 
uh, shoot an email over to Tom at hpgconsulting.com and I'll reply and get that to you. Robert? Excellent. Thank you, Tom. That was great. Um, you know, the, for those attending, I talked to Tom about doing this presentation. It's very important to, to look at your business, not just at the beginning of the year, but every so often. If you did the business model canvas just three months ago, it's going to look different today with the, you know, the increase in COVID cases and some of the changes that have gone on. Um, it's good to review it often and then create those smart goals around what you come up with in your business model canvas as your, your market may have changed or your client uh, target client may have changed a bit or your, your, your customers may not have changed, but some of the other surrounding factors may have changed and you have to target them in a different way or provide different things to, help maintain their confidence. So Tom, I, I appreciate you jumping on and doing this. We have some time for some Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions uh, regarding the business model canvas or some of the goal setting surrounding it for Tom, please uh, drop that in the Q&A box. Uh, we're gonna jump in there. I know Maria asked, uh, can we receive a copy of the business model canvas, the, the document he's working off of? Um, Tom, can you shoot that over to me? We will post it with the slide deck on our website Absolutely. Um, and download that model, um, the one that he was using. If yep. you Google it, you can find a lot of different versions of it in, in yep. different formats, yep. um, but we'll post the one that uh, Tom was working from so it matches the presentation. The one that I was working from, I'll, I'll just add a quick note about that. And the reason why I like the one that I'm working from is because, and my eyes are not so good anymore, <laughs> but the, uh, each of these boxes has contains uh, just a really in-depth set of questions and a lot more content about uh, each of these topics. So that's yes, I will get this over over to you, and you, if you include it with the presentation, that would be awesome. Excellent. Yep. Um, we have another question from Andy. How much pre-planning should you do before getting serious? When should you do a mark do market testing and taking their opinions before you get serious <laughs> the second that you think you've got got something um start moving uh the the best the best action you can take is to take action um you know we can uh, that's that's always been my experience if you sit and wait and you think well you know i and i, I guess i guess i need to also ask andy i'm not sure what you're thinking about uh when what you mean when you say serious um you know, maybe you don't have the funding yet, maybe you haven't thought through, or you don't have all the key relationships and partnerships built. Um, maybe that's what you refer to by serious, or you're just testing an idea and you're not sure if it's going to be a valid idea or, or a valid business model. Absolutely start testing right away uh, before you have any of that stuff in place, because that will help you uh, understand whether to move forward or not. You know, you've got, you're going to run into multiple go, no go decisions throughout this process. Uh, and the sooner you know that you're up against a no go, you're not going to waste any more time. All right. So I would suggest start testing the second you think you've got an idea um, and you're not even sure what you're testing yet. Just start the dialogues, start asking people, hey, would you pay 30 bucks a month for blah, 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 blah. Right. Um, that would be my my suggestion. So we got a few more questions in here. We have one in the chat, Tom, that I want to reach out to because um, I had to say I was thinking the same thing. Um, Nate was asking about third party companies to handle some of the marketing efforts and the schedules on behalf of the business. As I looked at the marketing goals you, you mentioned setting up, my thought was I'm a small business owner and the only employee or I may have one or two other employees. I don't have time for all that. How would I go about it? What would be best? What would be some options? Um, I'm going to mention first before I let you answer, Tom, for some of the third party companies, um, we've got two presenting, two different ones presenting next week um, on the boot camp, And we've had many others present on previous boot camp sessions. If you go back and look at our marketing sessions, they're all, third-party companies that can help with that. But Tom, I'll let you get an answer on what some businesses could do if that 
marketing piece seemed overwhelming as you were going through those goals? It did seem overwhelming. It's a lot to chew on. Um, I, I've got a couple thoughts on it. Um, yes, absolutely. I, I know Giselle, who's presenting next Tuesday, um, and, and she's the marketing wizard, mar marketing media wizard, I think she calls herself. Um, she's also a SCORE mentor. So Giselle uh, has a lot of experience and she owns a, a business helping businesses with their marketing. So uh, the, the, my first thought on it is, you know your business and you know your content better than anybody else. And I think my tendency is to lean toward building my own content first before I delegate it out to somebody because this really is my best foot forward about my business. And especially looking for the cheapest possible contractor, going and finding a Fiverr to build a video for me or whatever, um, is not going to necessarily be, it might be good enough, but it, it's not going to be my best foot forward. So I kind of have that tendency personally to lean toward not delegating <laughs> how my business looks to the world, right? Um, if I do need to delegate to somebody like Giselle and others that are, that, that are available, again, with my chamber of commerce perspective, I'm gonna stick local. I'm gonna find somebody here in my network and in my market that's here in Phoenix and I'm gonna support the Phoenix market and, and help somebody who's here buy a pizza on a Friday night because they can afford to, right? I'm not gonna go find somebody to do it for 10 bucks online and take a few days or a week to get back to me and send it offshore because it's 10 bucks. Um, that's my bias again as a, as a chamber exec and a local supporter. And we have such a strong community here of folks that can do all sorts of work uh, like this. And if you have a relationship with somebody and you can trust them and they're building the content that has the look and feel and the voice that you want to convey. And you've got a good collaboration with that individual or team. Absolutely. And you can afford to delegate it, <laughs> delegate it. You either have the time or you've got the money. You've got one or the other. Um, so if you have the time on your hands, do your own work. And if you have the money, delegate it. Or maybe it's a balance of the two. That's my thoughts on it. I hope that answers the question. Um, excellent. Uh, Tom, I'm going to go back. Andy had a kind of follow-up question and it says, and this goes back to, to testing your, you know, your model, asking people about the idea it says, should you worry about someone stealing your idea and implementing it before you get to it? It depends on the idea. Um, I, again, I personally don't worry too much about it. The assumption is that you're testing you're not necessarily turning over the keys to the nuclear reactor and saying, how does it feel to turn these keys, <laughs> right? You're not giving up everything when you're testing your assumptions. Just be careful with your survey questions and how you ask questions like, um, think of an example. You can find ways to not expose your copyrighted content, your patentable material and still ask if somebody would be willing to pay for something that does, you know, whatever, but you're not showing them what's under the hood and how you're doing it necessarily, right? Um, I would not be concerned about somebody stealing my idea. If they do, it's the ultimate sign of flattery. <laughs> if you've done nothing more than register your LLC and you've got a business in place and you're, and you're, uh, building out a website that documents that you're, you're selling a particular product or service or intend to, um, you've, you've got some recourse if somebody snags your idea, right? If somebody Excellent. takes it from you, you can say, hey, this has been established since January of 2021. I already had the URL. I already had you know, the business LLC configured, et cetera. I had a business checking account in my name. Here's my EIN. What are you doing taking this from me, right? Excellent. Uh, we got one more question to kind of wrap up today and, and I'll, I'll answer this. It's uh, from Monica says, how do you go about adding a line of business to your current business? Um, Monica, one thing I would do is go to the small business checklist 
and go through that. You can select the industries, the, the type of business, et cetera, and to see what, uh, what regulations and requirements there may be. I mean, your question, you mentioned a couple different industries. And so there may be some regulations with that and some compliance pieces, registration, uh, certifications you may need. So um, you can find that on the small business checklist. Um, right now, a lot of people are adding additional lines to their business to, to drum up more business. And, and that's uh, great to see, but the, the checklist is a very awesome tool to help with that. So with that, Tom, I wanna to go ahead and give you an opportunity to share any closing thoughts, any closing words you may have, and then we'll get wrapped up. I just appreciate the opportunity today. Thank you very much. Um, you know, if you're not working with a SCORE mentor or with SBDC, um, those are both, you know, arms of the, the Small Business Administration. Uh, I have experience with both. We have a great working relationship with SCORE mentors within the chamber. Um, and they use the business model canvas. They'll, their coaching is geared around uh, this. So if you want more help and more coaching through the business model canvas, a SCORE mentor is probably a great place to lean for no cost, by the way. And Again, I mentioned Giselle is doing a presentation next Tuesday on marketing, and she happens to be a SCORE mentor. So uh, you're going to see that perspective from her, I think. The SBDC uh, does a great job as well, again, free coaching and free mentoring uh, around a product called the Growth Wheel, and they have other tools as well. Uh, but I would suggest um, looking into either or both. Um, and of course, as a chamber exec, I got to say, uh, you're going to get the biggest bang for the buck uh, by getting engaged with an organization that helps uh, promote your business and helps advocate for your business uh, in the world. So within my chamber of commerce, just a, a very quick plug, uh, we're as inexpensive as $33 a month and you get a ton of SEO. You couldn't, you couldn't get the services we provide at this chamber for less than 500 a month if you had to go out and buy them on your own. Um, in terms of all the backlinks and things that you get and, and the help that we provide. So that's the extent of my plug for the chamber. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's the best value out there. And whatever community you live in, whatever chamber is close to you, wherever you are in the state, uh, consider it. Take a look at BNI, take a look at, at your chamber of commerce, look at service organizations um, and get engaged, get involved. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate that. Uh, I want to reiterate, I work closely with both SCORE and SBDC, and they're both great uh, partners of ours, and they are there to help small business owners throughout the state. They are available in all corners of the state um, and all the community colleges. So uh, uh, utilize them. They're there to, to help, and they want to help. So um, Again, I want to thank Tom for, for his presentation. This information is being recorded. The presentation is, and we will have the slide deck and the other tools available on our website, hopefully later today. Um, but they will be available to go back and review and uh, download. Uh, we do want to remind everybody, Tuesday morning, 9 a.m. is our next session, which is sell. It's a marketing session looking at marketing trends for 2021 and how it can help your business. And until then, we wish everybody to have a safe and happy weekend. Uh, enjoy the nice weather we seem to be having. And uh, we will talk to you on Tuesday. Have a great day.